Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Albrecht, and I'm the Advocacy Program Manager here at the ASM. Welcome to the Standard Time Advocacy Boot Camp. We are very excited for you to be here. Um, this will be a great session where you will learn you know, the tools that you need to advocate well for Standard Time, both at the state and national level. And we've, we've assembled a good panel of experts that will guide you through that process. Again, we're going to be starting out with Dr. Karen Johnson in just a second. We will have Representative Russ, Di Russ Diamond speak, Amy Kelbeck from our consulting firm, McDermott Plus, and Dr. Beth Mallon will give her experience. After that, we'll be having breakout groups that we hope you can join. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Karen Johnson. Dr. Johnson. Give me one sec to share screen. And get it big and swap. I'm, I'm in the right screen, right? Okay. Um, so my uh, job to start out is just to um, give a, sort of a brief summary of why um, we want a permanent standard time and some of the points that you might be um, giving to um, legislators uh, to try to convince them. Um, so. Again, this is not meant to be totally comprehensive, but just some of the key uh, sort of takeaways. Um, so overall surveys um, show about 75% of Americans want to end clock change, um, but it's sort of split. Some people favor permanent daylight savings time, some people um, prefer standard time, and other people just want it ended in no matter um, what way. Um, I like to say that permanent standard time is the healthiest, best, and most politically viable way to end clock change. A lot of people try to argue that daylight savings time is the most politically viable, um, but especially as uh, the Sunshine Protection Act failed to pass last year, um, and we have tried permanent daylight savings time in the past, it's become unpopular um, very quickly and uh, so really there's no reason to try something again. Additionally, permanent daylight saving time is federally permit, prohibited, whereas permanent standard time is, is allowed um, by uh, federal law. So states can decide to go to standard time at any other time. Um, and 60% of the world currently uses permanent standard time and the latest to adopt it um, is uh, Mexico that voted last year to switch back to permanent standard time. So again, there's two ways to end clock change. There's standard time, which is best aligned with solar time. The sun is, is closest to being overhead at noon, which happens at the meridian of the time zone. Um, and that leads to earlier sunrises and, and sunsets. Daylight savings time, the clock is shift by an hour. So the sun is overhead closer to 1 p.m. with later sunrises and sunsets. Now, because of gerrymandering of the um, time zones, there are sections um, in the western edges of almost every time zone that are already beyond um, a half hour off. So they actually have um, suns uh, overhead closer to even 1.30 to 2 p.m. and are even later. So because of uh, this delay in clock, there's a um, misalignment from our body rhythms. Our bodies stay aligned to the sun um, there's data that shows that we stay within two minutes of sun time, not the one hour change of the clocks. Um, additionally, and part of the reason um, we get this misalignment is that we really lose morning light, especially in the winter hours. So if we go to permanent daylight savings time, there'd be anywhere from two to four months with sunrises after 8 a.m. And some of the Southern states are the ones that have the darkest and longest periods with mornings because of the curve of the earth. Um, not only does daylight savings time um, delay our rhythms, but it affects our sleep. So studies show that an hour um, change in the clock time leads to about a 19 minute average loss of sleep um, every day that we're on daylight savings time. Sleep is more fragmented and we end up having more social jet lag, which is sleeping in later on weekends um, than on school or work days. Um, and more people end up with an evening chronotype um, which can be measured in either by preference or by the midpoint of sleep. And we know that if the midpoint of sleep is after 3.30 in the morning, that's associated with more adverse outcomes. And we get um, more people with that when we're on daylight savings time. 
So this misalignment leads to a lot of medical problems. A lot of people think of the short-term risks, and that's what we have the most data on. Um, we see increases in strokes and heart attacks, um, depression episodes, and most of these happen in the springtime because we're going to, to daylight savings time, the more misaligned time, and we're springing forward, so we're losing that hour of sleep. So there's sort of an additional acute um, sleep loss as, as well that happens in the spring. But what's actually more important for making the decision about permanent standard time versus permanent daylight savings time is really the long-term risk and what happens um, when we have that hour of delayed clock um, and sun misalignment. And so there's a number of studies that looked at outcomes, anything from cancer to obesity to heart attacks, diabetes, all of these increase um, the long-term risks of, of, of these health problems. And studies have estimated these risks um, of just some of these health problems alone costing over um, $2 billion a year in healthcare costs. Um, additionally, um, when we look at mood, a lot of people think because they get out of work, they get sun, that must be great for mood. Um, but they really are misinterpreting the effects of standard time with the effects of winter. Um, and standard time is actually protective. Um, and this was seen in Russia. There was a study that looked at when Russia had a three-year period on permanent daylight savings time and actually found higher rates of winter depression in adolescents during that period than they saw in either seasonal daylight savings time. And the period that has the least amount of winter depression was when they then switched to permanent standard time. Um, other people argue that permanent daylight savings time would be better to prevent car accidents, but that just isn't the case. Um, they're citing that more light in the evening would reduce accidents with more people on the road, but they're not talking about um, all the issues um, that affect safe driving. So things like making poor decisions and speeding and doing uh, drinking while driving and texting while driving, all those cognitive things as well as alertness are affected when we're on daylight savings time. And so a study that just came out last year really goes along with that. They found that the areas in yellow that were aligned to the appropriate um, time zone versus the areas in blue that were misaligned by over a half hour um, those blue areas had 21.8% more fatal car accidents um, per year. Um, additionally, I, oops, sorry, my, my picture isn't coming off, but uh, uh, permanent daylight savings time is also the period that has the most um, commute time in the dark because those mornings get so dark and stay dark until, um, again, past 8 a.m. Um, Daylight saving time is also bad for education. Um, teenagers who have more of the evening chronotype want to stay up late and sleep in late end up having the most misalignment and, and much greater increases in their social jet lag. And this impacts um, their education. A study in, era, in Indiana went, um, before it changed its time zone looked at a 10-year period of um, standardized test scores looking at the places that follow standard time versus the places that followed um, seasonal daylight savings time. And there were much lower um, test scores, 16% um, overall lower test scores um, where they were um, using permanent daylight savings time. But the interesting thing about this study is it was not effective felt evenly across the population. Those students coming from the lowest um, income um, places had a 49% lower test scores, whereas the highest only had 8% lower. So um, it's really important to recognize um, the structural disparities of daylight savings time. We know that there are um, at-risk groups that are already um, not getting enough sleep and more likely to be affected. So again, teenagers, but also um, people whose work start times are um, before eight o'clock in the morning, which again, disproportionately affects um, people from minorities and lower social economic um, status. Um, and then when we look at the economy, again, another common argument um, for why people say they want permanent daylight savings time is that it'll be light out later, people will spend more. And there are some studies um, that do um, support that at least in the fall and, and spring, when that incremental light is different, that there is um, a small increase in, in retail. Um, however, 
there is also increases um, in uh, energy costs, healthcare bills, um, and uh, gasoline bills at the same um, time. Um, but when we look at the economy as a whole, um, we realize why daylight savings time is bad because it really affects productivity. More people are likely to be tardy or miss school, more likely to be injured. Um, how education is very important for future um, salary and future um, performance. And so those students who are particularly affected um, will not achieve as much. Um, there are studies showing that CEOs make poor decision uh, making is when they're sleep deprived. Um, we know there's more mood problems, substance abuse problems. All these things really affect the workforce as a whole. And if there's anything we've learned from COVID is how important those workplace issues are. Um, and in terms of energy, um, one of the main reasons why daylight savings time was first brought um, in and, and um, back in World War um, One and, and the oil crisis back in 1974 when it was repeated was to try to save energy. Um, but what um, has been found more recently, especially as energy uses have changed and light energy has become more efficient and people have more heat and cooling, is that utility bills go up. Um, again, there was a study in Indiana that showed this. There's been studies in Australia and Japan and other places. Um, and overall, the reason there's um, more cost is because um, now you're getting up earlier when it's still darker. So you have less time for the sun to heat up the cold mornings when people are out. So they need to use heat more. And then in the evenings, um, it's staying hotter later. So more people are up and using air conditioning. Also, that 19 minutes on average less sleep is about 1% less sleep time. And people that are awake tend to use um, more energy. Um, so all those reasons are the main reasons why we feel daylight's savings time is bad um, and why we support permanent um, standard time. There's a lot of other groups that are um, coming on board with per, um, endorsing permanent standard time, um, different sleep um, and scientific societies. Um, one of the uh, groups that joined us in the medical societies this year was the American Medical Association. Um, the American Academy of Neurology just signed on. And then um, there's education um, groups and safety groups like the National Safety Council. And then there's some religious groups. So um, especially um, some of the Jewish groups um, care about um, daylight savings time because they have certain prayer rituals that can only happen after the sun rises. So if the sun is only rising at 8.30, 9.30 in the morning, it makes it very hard um, to have a normal work day. Um, and lastly, I just want to go over what the current legislative activity is. Um, if you look at uh, these sort of uh, charts with the tallies on the side, um, as we've gone uh, from 2021 at the bottom here up to 2023, um, we are slowly increasing the number of yellow bills or standard time um, bills. Um, so um, proportionately, uh, this year, um, we are getting, uh, we're now at 30% of the bills that are out there being permanent standard time um, and getting um, some new states with these um, bills. There are still a number of states that are pushing um, permanent daylight saving time bills. And there's some states that push either and say, we'll go to either way if other states um, decide. A lot of um, these state bills, um, especially uh, the standard time bills and some of the daylight savings time bills have um, packs where it says, if the states around me also go, that we will go too. So um, a number of states about, I think it's 17, have passed bills that say, if the federal government approves permanent daylight savings time, we will um, go to it. Um, we Because permanent standard time can be gone to at any time, um, there are, um, some bills like California that do say that we will go either way if it's if if there's a federal decision, um, but otherwise um, Arizona, Hawaii, and all of the um, territories as well as Mexico already are on permanent um, standard time. So that is where I want to stop at this point. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for all that insight. And again, we'll go over a lot of those things more in the breakout sessions if you need more information or anything like that. Um, but we'll turn it over to um, 
to Representative Diamond. Again, Representative Diamond has been fighting for standard time in his state. And we just wanted to get your experience um, with standard time in the state legislature and um, where you think we'll go from here. Sure, so I've had the standard time bill now going on three sessions here in Pennsylvania. And the reason I got behind it uh, was, uh, look, I, I've heard plenty of complaints from constituents who are parents of young children, they have pets, or farmers who have cows that don't wear watches. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the over overwhelming sentiment is, as Dr. Johnson's slides show, people want to stop changing clocks because it's, it's just a pain. And I'm a guy who has a main clock in my house that you can't move backwards. You have to unplug it for an hour and just wait an hour. And I'm kind of a stickler for exactness. So I love all my clocks to be exactly in sync. So uh, that's why I got behind this. And I also remember uh, as a 10 year old child, the experiment in 1974, uh, because I had to get catch the bus very early. I had to walk down uh, a wooded road that had no sidewalks and had a dangerous, you know, fall over the side of the road, didn't really have a shoulder there. So I remember that as well. So that's why I got behind um, standard time as opposed to permanent daylight time. Um, so here in Pennsylvania, I was the first one to introduce such a bill. There was a resolution at the same time to talk about, to encourage car Congress to talk about um, permanent daylight time. That was over in the Senate. Uh, this past session, uh, we had two bills, two competing bills in the House. One was mine for permanent standard time. One was for permanent daylight time. We held voting sessions. Both of them got moved, moved out of committee. Um, only one then came up uh, for permanent daylight time, came up for a vote on the House floor. It actually passed by one vote. And I think it was it was good that it passed, even though, you know, it did, the Senate didn't take it up because now people were talking about stopping change, changing clocks. And that's my focus now, um, because, look, this is an argument between logic and emotion. And, you know, the logic and all the science says that standard time is better, it's healthier, it's safer and all that sort of thing. On the other side, you have the emotion of those who romanticized that late, you know, that uh, late day daylight in the summertime when the truth of the matter is most of them are probably when that's at its peak, they're in their house enjoying their air conditioning, wasting even more energy. So but you have that emotion versus science argument. Um, so that's the battle I've been fighting when I talk to people about this bill is, you know, the, emo the emotion versus the science. And I, I think we have to continue. I'm glad to see that the American Medical Association has jumped aboard standard time. I would think that I would hope, though, that we could get also the insurance industry to get behind this, too, because it will help them on, in a, a financial way. Um, however, now uh, we've begun a new session here in Harrisburg. And both uh, the prime sponsor of the Permanent Daylight Time and myself, we've both submitted our competing bills again. But I changed the, the, the lead uh, line on my bill from permanent standard time to stop changing clocks, because that garners a little bit more right out of the vote support and association with your name. You're the guy that wants to start changing clocks. So hopefully this year, We'll get the same thing where we'll be able to have a conversation and, and, and hopefully my bill, you know, the, the, the logic will overcome emotion. And, you know, th this really is about the logic and the science of this. However, I will caution people against using the term follow the science. After the last three years, that kind of that term kind of has a bit of connotation with it. Uh, both politically and, and, and psychologically with people. So, you know, we, ju we just go out and, you know, talk to people about the facts, educate them about the facts. I mean, here in Pennsylvania, it's very easy to do with a globe because you can show people the meridians on, or the, the, the longitudinal lines on the on the globe, and you can count how many it is away from the prime meridian or the 
you know, uh, Greenwich Mean Time, you go, look, this we're, we're smack dab in the middle here. Uh, I also try to sell people on the idea that, uh, you know, we here in Pennsylvania, we call ourselves the Keystone State for a reason. I do believe uh, if Pennsylvania would do this first, all our neighbors would fall in line because we've got banking interests in Delaware that are right. You know, a lot of people from Pennsylvania work there. I think Delaware would fall with us. And then when those banking interests fall, well, then New York's going to fall, too. But uh, I do think that one state that does it the right way the first time will lead the entire nation. It's just my hope to make that that state Pennsylvania. So that's been the legislative battle here. It is, again, logic versus re, uh, logic versus versus emotion. And you have to debunk all those emotional attachments that people have to it, but you have to do it in a very kind way that doesn't set them off because, you know, people are more inclined to follow their emotions than science. So uh, that's where we're looking at here. And I will keep fighting the battle. And, you know, hopefully we'll be able to team up with some other people across the nation to get that battle fought in other states as well. Can I ask you one question about your name? In Massachusetts, we were having a decision whether the name would help guide it to a particular committee. So we added for the health of the population, hoping that it might end up in the health committee. Do you do you think that would work or do you think they'd pre-decide uh, the economy and commerce, commerce anyways? It, it really depends on the actual process and rules of how bills are assigned in your individual state. Here in our state, these type of bills would automatically go to the state government committee, which I was a member of. Um, but even if I wasn't a member of it, I would probably here in Pennsylvania, like I can ring up the speaker's office and his staff and I, I, I can go, look, I'm putting this bill in and I would prefer it be referred to X committee. But if you want to tailor it to a more friendly committee anywhere uh, in, in your state's legislature, I guess you could figure out how to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, there's 50 different ways to do that, apparently. So there's, you know, 50 different choices. Perfect. Well, again, thank you for your time. I think that's provided a lot of great insight for our advocates. And again, you know, we've, I think we've turned a corner here with standard time versus daylight savings time. So, you know, we're going to work towards that in the future, but thank you. All right. Senator. Thank you so, so much for having me and best of luck. Thanks. Um, so next up, we're going to have um, Amy Kelbeck, who is going to be talking to us about um, about what you to expect when you are meeting with a legislator and how you kind of operate, um, you know, operate, you know, the meeting time that you have with them. So Amy, if you if you would like to start, sure. Um, so first of all. Uh... Hello to those folks that we've already done meetings with and Dr. Mallow, who um, was our was an excellent witness at last year's hearing. So I've gotten the opportunity to work with a few of you on this before. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm with McDermott Plus Consulting, which is um, your contract lobbying firm. We are located here in Washington, D.C. Um, we host your lobby days, uh, which we're very excited to host again this year. So I just wanted to go over kind of tips and tricks, best practices for Hill meetings. Um, and to kind of level set, given that we're in this new post, kind of post COVID world, and a lot of folks have gotten accustomed to Zoom, and there's also an interest in bringing folks in from the member state or district, I do think a lot of these meetings will be on Zoom. So keep that in mind. Um, in general, a meeting with with an office will be with the staff member and it will be 30 minutes. And so you really want to make good use of those 30 minutes. And when I say that, that I don't mean uh, making sure they hear every single facts that we have on daylight savings, but really educating them, but offer, offering a lot of time for discussion and to get feedback from them. And I'll go into a little bit as to why. So first of all, Kind of the overall flow of any Hill meeting, either in person or on Zoom, is kind of going to go as the following. So either ASM or McDermott Plus staff, either myself or my colleague Karen, would kind of be like the MC. So wait for everyone to get on, you know, and then we do some quick intros. And the person kind of MCing will point to each person. 
for the ASM doctor that we have in the meeting, I think it's really important for that person to mention their state that they're from, possibly the district, if they live in that member's district, if they serve patients from that member's district, but then also kind of what the focus of your work is. You know, for Dr. Mallow, I know that you study pediatric sleep disorders, and I think focusing on that and making a mention of kind of what your specialty is and kind of what you can really speak to in the meeting is important. But overall, intros shouldn't be more than two to three minutes tops. And that's including the other staff introducing themselves. Then you go into background on the issue. And I think this is sometimes where there's a little bit of a meeting breakdown. And I mean this, you know, as I think we all get into this, we want to spend so much time educating that we don't leave ample time for discussion and feedback. And the discussion and feedback is so important because We don't know if we've even made an impact, if we have a long ways to go, or if they're on our side, or if they're just not even interested in working with us at all until we hear their comments. And those comments often lead to more education. So after we do the background, three to four minutes on that, kind of high level, why we're here, what we want to talk about, why we care about permanent standard time, then you should always have a specific ask. And a specific ask is not, I would like to serve as a resource as you work on this issue. A specific ask is, I would like you to co-sponsor HR or Senate Bill 123. In the meetings we're having right now, a lot of times we're asking someone, hey, we want you to co-lead our legislation that would create permanent standard time. Separately, our ask of folks can be, we would like you to not co-sponsor the Sunshine Protection Act when it's reintroduced this year for previous co-sponsors. Those are both asks. Serving as a resource is not an ask. And I I say that as a former health staffer who had a lot of meetings and with, we'd like to be a resource to you. Um, Finally, and again, going back to my earlier point, the discussion and the questions, that's really where you want to focus your time. Let's say half the meeting. So aim to have about 15 minutes of discussion and questions. And it's likely that the first question you're going to get asked is go back to something you said earlier. I'd really like to better understand what impact this has on kids or my boss really cares about this. What can you tell me about that? And it's those interactions that give you clues onto what someone else is interested in, but also how realistic it is that they're going to do what we want them to do, right? If we immediately get really pointed questions, not a lot of like, trust in what we're saying. I think we know we have some work to do and they sh- they might be a problem. Not, you know, they might be someone that ends up not doing what we'd like, but if they're really open and engaging and interested, and I think then we can know that we have an opportunity there. And I think that that's really important. It's not always about getting folks to say yes to you. It's knowing where to spend your time and your energy. Um, so then to kind of go more into some of the best practices and tips Um, so again, the goal of every, any meeting is to both educate and get feedback. And a lot of that feedback and education can be done during that Q and A and discussion portion. Um, also remember, I say this as a former staffer, especially on the house side, a lot of staffers are young. Like when I, I left the house when I was 31, uh, I worked there from the time I was 23 till I was 31. And so you can imagine and I was one of the senior like house staffers because I like worked for a member when I left. I was like one of the energy and commerce health LAs. And those tend to be just folks that have been around for a little bit. If you're meeting with off committee offices, especially expect the person's going to be about 25 to 26 years old on the house side. And on the Senate side, you're going to get more into the 30s, maybe some if you're meeting with LC in the late in the late 20s. But I think more most importantly, we have to take them as serious counterparts. They are the gatekeepers. They are influential. They are often the person that not only, they don't need, my job really was to be a gatekeeper, right? If I didn't even think that it was something my boss would want to deal with or be supportive of, I would be the person to make that decision. And if I decided, I don't think this is something that she's going to be interested in, it might not even get to her. And so we do have to recognize that staff has that role, even if they are young and maybe not well-versed, even on the issue of healthcare in general. On committee folks, which we will be targeting mostly, especially to co-lead the legislation, that's going to be more substantial knowledge, work on issues on a really granular basis, work on committee issues, mark up legislation. Those folks will 
will tend to have more of a serious health or a more substantial healthcare background. But no matter what, they are gatekeepers and decision makers, and we should treat them as such. Um, I think, you know, I've mentioned this before, but trying to find a connection to a member is really important. You know, you're from the state, you treat patients at a certain hospital, you did your training at a certain hospital, or they practice a certain subspecialty and you practice that same subspecialty. I think also using examples uh, with specific data is helpful. You know, verse one, one example would be instead of saying the switch to daylight savings time is bad for kids, we could say children saw a 20% reduction in sleep after we spring forward. I'm not saying that that's the exact stat. And I, I have no question that this group would love to focus on the stats and the data. So I, I know I'm preaching to the choir on that one. Um, you know, and then I would say, we are really focused on committee members uh, right now to be a co-lead. And the reason behind that is because committees of jurisdiction really look to uh, legislation from their own members to advocate for in advance. And that includes hearings, markups, and advancement to the floor. It's very uncommon for committee staff to do that process for legislation that has been introduced by members off committee if it's relevant to a committee topic or it's in the jurisdiction of that committee. The the examples of that are, you know, cancer patient type bills, you know, bills that are meant to kind of make small tweaks for a really niche group of patients, things that have over 100 co-sponsors. But by and large, they're always going to look to committee members and see the, who those, what members have bills that are within current committee jurisdiction and have, you know, some some chance of advancement. And then finally, I think, you know, we want to always identify a follow-up or a next step at the end of a meeting. And that doesn't have to be, you know, I'll get you edits on this thing. It can be as much as you're going to talk to your boss and then we'll circle back. Or, you know, you don't, when we ask them something, we don't want to just ask it and like, let it sit out there. We want to say, okay, what's the next step here? Are you going to have a conversation with your boss? Would you like us to send you some additional materials? And then that action step also gives us something to go back to and say, hey, you know, it was great meeting with you two weeks ago. Have you had a chance to speak with your boss? Is there any other information we can provide for you? And with that, I will see if there's any questions or comments. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, that was very helpful. And um, just a comment from Representative Diamond. He just wanted to comment that, you know, um, that always keep in mind that legislation gets passed based on the relationships and more than more than sheer knowledge. So, you know, take these meetings as an opportunity to build a relationship with the legislator, especially if it's your state legislator. They probably don't live too far from you. They, they probably know the local area. So, you know, be genial with them. Um, I'll look to see if there's any other um, questions. And also build a relationship with the staff, you know, whoever we have leading our bill. Like right now I'm doing a letter for another client I have. And I mean, I'm emailing one of these two staffers, I don't know, six times a day. And they have to want to answer my emails because there's information that I can't possibly get without their help. Perfect. Well, again, th thank you, Amy, for joining us and for that insight. And again, if you're joining us on, you know, on the Hill, you probably meet Amy in the future. Thanks. Thank you. And we're um, passing off the bet. <laughs> hi there. Yeah. And Karen, um, Karen, can you, I think it's showing my, it looks like it's showing um, like it's in a different mode. I think you want to flip the display on the slides. If not, I can, I can check. Um, try swapping dis under display settings. The second. I just swapped. That didn't go right. Yeah. Try again. Um, pull down display settings. Yeah. Try that. Swap presenter view. I, right there. It, I swap. I'll pull, I'll pull it up, Karen. Okay.
Eric, do you have the most recent version I sent? Or? I do, yes. Okay, great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I, I want to get us to our breakout room, so I'll be really quick. Um, I just wanted to make sure everybody was as fired up about advocacy as we are. Uh, and here's the definition. I'll just mention it can be at any level, state, local, federal. It's rewarding. It's stimulating. I'm taking science communication classes right now through the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science. And what a great issue to, as Russ said, that Representative Diamond said, to be able to combine emotion and reason and logic and all. And it develops relationships. I mean, you'll have a whole group of fun people to work with, like uh, this group right here. Let's go to the next slide. And uh, this is just an article that uh, I was uh, honored to represent the SRS and the Sleep Research Society, if you want to take a look at it. I tried to make it really balanced and talk about the positives on both sides, and yet how um, the health arguments really are on the um, permanent standard time side. Next slide. Uh, I did get to testify before Congress last year, and I was interviewed for the Rolling Stone, although this is a mock-up cover that my husband's friend made. Uh, I wasn't really on the cover of the Rolling Stone, but I was interviewed in it. I was also in 1A, and I wrote an op-ed for my Tennessean uh, newspaper on all-time standard time being healthier, all year standard time being healthier than daylight saving time or changing clocks. And I put up the slide not to show that I, you know, have done all these things, but it's I should I put up the slide to show you that it can be really fun and stimulating and exciting to you go beyond your clinic and your doctoring or your, your health professional work, and you can really make an impact. Next slide. These are some of the lessons I learned uh, about testifying before Congress on permanent standard time. And I believe Eric will be sending out some links uh, that you can uh, go to. And just to, just to sum up, whether you're testifying locally or you're just talking to your Congress people in their office, remember that you are expert enough. We all feel like, who am I to do this? Am I good enough? But you are because you do this every day with your patients. And it's a great experience, as I said, uh, to further your science and health communication skills. Like, Dr. like Representative Diamond said, remember to tell stories. I love that story that he told about being at the bus as a kid in the 70s, I have to say I was there too, uh, in the dark, waiting for the school bus. Um, practice delivering your message in short segments. Avoid having, even if, even if you're testifying, you still want to speak in short segments, especially if you're talking to your um, legislator, like Amy just said, you want to have a conversation with them. You, you want to talk less and listen more. And um, I was prepared with Eric and others when I did my testimony, they practiced with me. Definitely try to think about what questions you might be asked. And remember that submitting written testimony or writing op-eds can be very impactful also. Next slide. So this is my, I'm so glad I put this in after hearing uh, Representative Diamond speak. Know your audience and draw them in. This is a picture of kids waiting in the dark for the school bus, and it is extremely impactful. So use these kinds of things when you talk to your audience. Uh, I also want to point out here that this is at 7.35 in the morning, and this is when schools in the 70s uh, started at 8 or 8.30, or maybe even later. And now we know schools start at 7.20, 7.00. 10 in some cases. So um, the school start times, folks, really, this is a great opportunity for us to work together and support each other. Because, I mean, can you imagine with start times of 710, if we were to go to permanent daylight time, it would be even darker for our kids. Um, so go to the next the last slide. So just um, some final take home messages. Know your rules. Filing deadlines are super important. Uh, you need to know when you need to contact your legislators to get them to file bills. Start contacting them early. 
In Tennessee, I actually contacted people who voted for permanent daylight saving time um, two years ago, and I took that tact of we're both on the same side. We both want to get rid of the clock change. Uh, so that, you know, think about that. Um, your your goal is, is to find an issue and find a way into the issue that is compelling. And then you can you can hit them with the with the evidence, the overwhelming evidence on health uh, for permanent standard time. And then if you find someone to sponsor the bill, get their cell phone if you can, ask how you can be helpful understand they're crazy busy with maybe 35 other bills. So figure out how you can be helpful to them. For me, it was reaching out to JP. It's um, Safe Standard Time who had already crafted all of these bills that made their job a lot easier. And then reach out to your network. Rotary clubs, I mentioned Start School Later, um, state medical societies, uh, collect forms on who wants to help you with what, and then give them a set of materials that they could share like op-eds. Next slide. I think that's it. Yes, that's all. Perfect. Well, thank you for sharing your experience, Dr. Mallow. Um, that was very helpful. All right. Well, I'm going to try one more time to see if mine will share correctly. Yeah, um, actually, I think it did that time. There it is. Is that looking good? Yes. Um, so I have, you know, some some similar comments, but try to add a few other things. Um, you know, one thing that I found important um, in Massachusetts, where I am, is trying to get endorsements. So I really went after uh, the Mass uh, Medical Society and was able to get their endorsement. And certainly when I've said that to legislators, they go, oh, the Mass Medical Society has endorsed it. And so things like that are meaningful um, I think especially because a lot of people think there's a, a big economic, um, you know, debate with this issue, any way that you can get, you know, your state's farm boards or education committees or, you know, other um, either economic interests or other groups that are non-medical, I think this is a topic that's really important. So, you know, reach out to your friends, your family, you know, who do you know? Do you know someone who's a farmer? Do you know someone who's, you know, on, on this group? Um, the other group that I got actually reached out to me were like, um, you know, the young Dems of Western Mass. So, you know, there's these young political um, activist groups who, who like things. And I think especially the young people, this is a really important issue for. Uh, I also reached out to my high school and got their civics teacher uh, to, to assign this as a, as a uh, issue for their class. And they're going to all write out to their legislators and try to put together material um, about it and tweet on social media and, and do those things. Um, a couple of things about uh, bill sponsors. Um, one thing that I found was I, I went to uh, people in September thinking that was plenty a, ahead of time to get them um, ready to go for their January bill submission time. And people are already saying that, you know, they've already are maxed out in the number of bills they can um, submit. So you do want to get to people early with your requests, you know, getting them on board. Um, for whatever cycle. And again, those there's certain time periods when bills can get um, submitted. One thing I like to do is just Google their websites for who I'm talking to and see what they say. If someone says, you know, my top priority is, is education or, um, you know, or transportation or whatever it is, you know, say, you know, when you're talking to them, you can bring that out. Or when you're sending them an email, you know, I see your top priorities are, you know, are education and, you know, and, and, you know, workforce, um, and you can really relate um, that to this issue. Um, one thing when you're meeting with people, you know, it, it can be very powerful. We talk about those stories to ask them, have, have they ever or any family members been act, impacted by sleep problems and kind of then link back and say, you know, like you saw how, how much that family member, how you were impacted when you had that period, you weren't sleeping well. Just imagine if we can improve that on a large scale for everyone. Um, and then, you know, for emailing legislators, um, you know, I just went to the Mass website. I um, sort of copied over to an Excel spreadsheet um, all the names and emails, and then I just went through and and sort of sent one email after after another, and, and within a couple hours sent sent to all 200 plus legislators in the state. So it's a little time consuming, but you know, there are ways to sort of um, do do sort of mass um, emailing. Um, the other thing that we learned also with with um, is standard time is an issue where it 
you know, you might think of that you're as a doctor or asking for the health committee. So you do have to watch out. There's um, especially at the federal level, um, people have multiple staffers and they might be the staffer for health issues. They might be the staffer for commerce issues. So we had one meeting with the health woman and she's like, that's great, but this bill is not under my purview. So make sure you know which where these bills are following and ask to talk to the staffer that um, is really related to this bill. Um, again, use connections, use social media. Um, and, and as uh, Rep. Diamond said, you know, uh, build connections. So, you know, attend fundraising events or other, you know, events that politicians are out. If you have a, um, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a fair or a festival or something like that in town. The politicians are out at there. Go up, shake hands, say hi. You do that five times, they start to get to know you. Um, you know, if you get into this, you potentially will start getting media requests. Um, it's really good for media. You know, you'll talk to them for 20 minutes and they will take one line that they, you know, write down or or put in a um, a TV or a radio thing. So try to really get what is the one line you want them to take and, and say it and make sure you kind of, you know, repeat that, that sort of sound bite that you want them to take away. Um, after you meet with them, you know, follow up, thank them. Um, and then once a bill is intact, it'll be sent to a committee. And then often those come up really quickly. And, um, you know, they'll be like, you have to submit in testimony by, you know, noon tomorrow or three days from now. So be ready um, to have those testimonies. A lot of times, um, so, you know, there's different ways. There's testimony, some are in person, some you can submit video things, some you can submit written. Um, some of the videos are like a three minute video. So potentially, you know, have that three minute video um, ready to go. Um, Stave Standard Time is a great resource and can help um, with a lot of this. Um, we are putting together a set of educational videos. Um, there's six now posted on safestandardtime.com. Um, there'll be a total of 12 that go through the different issues. And so these can be resources you can um, refer legislators to and certainly watch to learn more yourself. Um, at the sleep conference, we're going to have a sleep health discussion um, group um, with people with uh, sort of the permanent standard time as well as the start school um, later folks um, and uh, talking about sort of advocacy in general. We hope you'll join us. It is the last session of the conference, so you do have to stay all the way to the very end. Um, and so, you know, when you think about next steps, um, you know, hopefully with coming here, you'll decide that you will at least take some step for um, actively advocating. Um, we really want people to um, make uh, changes at a state level. So while we want this to happen at a federal level, um, right now, one thing the federal people say is, well, there's these 17 bills for daylight savings time. And so that's what people want. Um, but a lot of those passed before people were speaking out against it. So once we have been speaking out against it, that, that momentum has really slowed for passing those bills. Um, and because um, permanent daylight savings time bills are federally prohibited, a lot of those bills got snuck through with really no discussion. And that's sort of what happened with the Sunshine Protection Act. It passed the Senate unanimously. And then um, with, you know, they just brought it up to the floor one day and said, vote. And no one knew what they were even voting for. And then the House went, whoa, that's not, you know, we, we need to talk about this. So um, you got to. Uh, you know, sort of um, get out there, find out what's happening. And we really want those state level bills to try to really push the federal bills that there is momentum for permanent standard time. Um, safe standard time as a quick way to send sort of form letters to your legislators. So please share this um, with your friends and family to text uh, 50409 or SST to 50409. Um, and uh, you can follow safe standard time either through Facebook or um, you can reach out and we can uh, attach you to the Slack account. Um, or if you just want to let us know that you're interested in what state um, you want updates on, um, we're happy to keep you updated with any action. Um, there's a lot of resources online. So this is I research of biologic rhythms, a sleep research study, ASM, and um, we need more people educating. So write up as post on social media, give grand, grand rounds um, uh, in your area, you know, talk at your, your sleep, um, uh, you know, meetings and, and other places. Um, and so lastly, um, we are going to jump over to our breakout sessions, I believe. 
Uh, you have all gotten links that Eric has shared with people. Um, when you go, uh, what we're hoping for is people to spend just a very short time um, saying who they are. And we're hoping for one or two people to sort of practice, um, you know, their, their two, three minute pitch, just so we can kind of have people take a try at it and give some feedback. Um, and that'll be a great point to otherwise ask questions or if anyone has other experiences that they want to um, share. So I think anything last, Eric? No, um, again, we will. We hope to see you over in the breakout sessions. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me on next steps if you can't make that. And we'll see you over in the rooms. Take care.